Professor Martin Oll. I'm an old age psychiatrist and also a member of the Interdem board. I'm uh, very delighted to be um, hosting this session on, um, on the issues with uh, managing uh, coronavirus uh, and COVID and its impact on dementia care. And I'd like to start off with um, Emma Wolverson, who's going to be talking about supporting inpatient mental health in dementia care um, during COVID-19. Now, the sessions, as you know, are recorded and we'll have some time uh, after each presentation uh, for, for questions. And if you can put your uh, points and your questions on the chat, that'd be very helpful. And then we'll pick up the comments on the chat and um, put them to Emma and uh, see what she says. So now we're starting the talk. Uh, thank you very much, Emma. Uh, very pleased to hear your presentation. Hello, my name's Emma Wolverson. I'm a clinical psychologist and a senior lecturer in the UK. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation, which is about the impact of COVID-19 on the delivery of mental health inpatient care for people with dementia. In this presentation, I'll give you some background into mental health inpatient care and some of the unique challenges of working in this area. I realise it's an area that not everyone will be familiar with in the same way that we might be with uh, hospital care or residential care. I'm going to share my experiences of working with staff during COVID and hopefully make an argument for the need for more research in this area. In an era of human rights and dementia, it's felt increasingly difficult to say that I work in a mental health inpatient unit. We rarely think and talk about the fact that people with dementia can be sectioned under the Mental Health Act. And as this quote shows, most people with dementia never think about an inpatient stay as part of their journey. Inpatient mental health settings come in all different shapes and sizes. They might be part of a hospital or a standalone unit like the one where I work. Uh, they might just be for people with dementia or they might be for older people with a range of diagnoses. And they might be a joint physical and mental health venture or they might be a standalone mental health in a traditional kind of ward setting. This makes it really challenging to bring an evidence base together for inpatient care. How comparable are all these different settings? And just finding the research is really difficult. So who is admitted to an inpatient mental health care setting? Well, as you can see from this quote, it's very much a last resort. It's for people whose needs cannot be met in other areas. It's an expensive form of care. There's been a huge drive in the UK to reduce the number of inpatient beds, whilst at the same time, the number of people being sectioned has gone up, particularly people with dementia. As it's very much a last resort, there's often a sense from other mental health services that things have failed and that the person's been let down. People can be admitted to a mental health setting from a range of areas, including general hospital, residential care or from their own homes. The research tells us that the two main reasons people are admitted are aggression and psychosis. The literature also demonstrates that this is a very unwell population with a high number of physical health problems and infections and often taking a large number of medications, which really complicates the picture when you're working in this area. And there's growing concerns in the literature about the length of stay that people have in mental health inpatient settings. And the mean average length of stay varies wildly across units. Um, and some literature reports it from 92 days right up to 365 days as an average length of stay. From our own experience on the ward where I work, um, there's some patterns to why people are admitted. Um, we get a lot of people admitted who find receiving care very difficult, often because of very difficult early lives, um, difficult with difficulties with trust, often histories of abuse. Um, we get a lot of people who find a closed environment very difficult, um, perhaps because they've been in prison or uh, we've had prisoners of war or just people that have worked outside their whole life. And so the move to residential care is incredibly challenged for them and just doesn't work. We also get a lot of people admitted who have a long history of mental health problems, who have been in and out of inpatient settings all their lives and continue to do so with their dementia. And I just draw attention to the last one on there, which is a, a growing area for us really, is a large number of people with end of life needs who are admitted to our unit. 
and because of the difficulties in prognosticating end of life and dementia people haven't realized that they're dying the diagnostic overshadowing where pe changes in people's behavior are, are you know seen as a symptom of dementia and not as an unmet palliative care need and that's really grown during COVID-19 as a reason for admission. We know very, very little about the experiences of staff who work on mental health inpatient settings for people with dementia. A review of the literature only found two papers exploring staff experience, and both of them express real concerns about how we recruit and retain staff in this really challenging environment. There's a sense that these wards and these units might have their own cultures and behaviours that we really need to learn more about. And a suggestion that when given space for reflection, staff were able to change their understandings of behaviours and become more empathetic. So what challenges did COVID-19 bring to the inpatient mental health sector for people with dementia? Well, in many ways, we saw similar challenges to those in residential care settings and in hospital settings that have been widely spoken about. But there are perhaps some unique challenges. And one is that given that this is an acutely unwell population, the level of stress and agitation is often very, very high. And that combined with COVID proved very difficult. Staff on mental health units are largely mental health staff and not trained general nurses. And so monitoring people's physical status, you know, providing additional support relied on through the door services and support from palliative care and district nursing, which was very difficult. There's also a huge policy gap in the area. So there was lots of policies published for mental health units around how to handle COVID-19, but they didn't fit dementia wards at all. And there was lots of guidance around delivering palliative care during COVID-19 but very little around dementia. And so it often felt like we were really falling be between the cracks and very much forgotten about in an incredibly challenging time. So now to tell you a little bit about my role in supporting staff on our inpatient unit during the COVID pandemic. Well, obviously it's always important to start with getting the basics right. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, breaks, food, making sure everyone was fed on every shift and that people got regular breaks, protected breaks, was really important, particularly when people were wearing enhanced PPE all the time. We also created what we called our wobble room, which was an area for staff off the ward where they could go and take some time. The message on our unit was very much that it's okay not to be okay and that we all have a wobble. One of the roles that we took on as psychologists was around family support. And so we agreed that we would contact every family member of, uh, sorry, every family for someone staying on our ward each day during COVID. So we would ring family, we would arrange Skypes, so we would help, you know, that connection between the person was in our ward when visiting wasn't allowed. And the idea was that it was taking a pressure off the ward. So there wasn't those phone calls in the office for the nurses and the staff that were doing so much already. And that really helped and that was really appreciated. I think what we didn't realise we were doing though was taking a valuable source of support and praise and um, the families often give a lot to the staff and we sort of inadvertently took that feedback loop away. And so now what we do at the end of the, each week is we send an email to all staff with all the positive comments and the praise and the thanks from the families that we've spoken to. So staff still hear that because it's been really important. We very much maintained uh, an in-person role every day on the ward. So I know that some multidisciplinary teams have kind of really stepped back and just had essential staff on the ward. We've taken the opposite approach really and made sure that staff are a daily presence, psychology staff are a daily presence on the ward. So offer that informal, in-person support, very much the, the conversation about what, what are people worried about? How are the kids, people's worries? about their parents, to be there. You know, every time a rule changed or guidance changed, there was always a bit of a wobble. We just had to be there to help people think about that. And in addition to that, that daily presence and that informal support, we provided, I guess, what people think more formally as psychology and in supervision. Um, and that was additional to their usual clinical supervision. And the way this worked was that each day, the ward manager was, would highlight staff on shift who she thought would benefit from some time. They were allocated that time to come and sit with me 
and have some support and have a chat in a, in a safe space from someone who wasn't their line manager. Um, and we talked a lot about self-care and how people were looking after themselves and just sort of educating staff and helping to, to understand the emotions that they were experiencing, a lot of normalising. And the other role I took on was the daily support for the ward manager. She was under enormous pressure, incredible pressure. And so it was a daily debrief at the end of her shift just to give her a chance to offload, to share her concerns, to make sure that she was able to keep supporting the staff and to keep her resilience. There were some things that didn't work. One thing that didn't work was bringing people together for any group supervision or reflective practice. We learned very quickly that staff were on very different journeys and um, it was quite difficult to hear other people's worries when you're feeling totally overwhelmed. We know that some wards that work locally were giving out a phone number for psychology and making support very optional, ring this number if you're struggling, and that approach really didn't work. Um, we found that, you know, in the NHS across the UK, there's very much a message that NHS staff are heroes, are angels, the work you're doing is incredible. Um, and we really had to counter that message and say, you know, this is a job and it's okay not to be okay and you really have to ask for support. And there was a lot of modelling from myself and from the senior staff on the ward that we were all finding it really difficult to hoot. And that, that was really essential to helping staff to seek support and talk about how they were feeling. So that's just a little flavour of, of what we did to support staff on the inpatient unit. There are a number of challenges to think about going forward for the inpatient sector. Staffing is clearly one of them and the need to mix the skills of staff given the complexity of the needs of the clients that come onto inpatient units. COVID has certainly taught us that we have an issue with physical care environments and inpatient settings. A lot of inpatient buildings are not purpose built for people with dementia. Um, some of the units haven't had access to outside space so visiting wasn't possible. Um, we know a lot about the importance of physical environment and we really need to take that into the inpatient area. And we need to think about the skills, training and support for staff to deliver end of life care in a really challenging setting um, and how we share skills and learning between palliative care and dementia care. What we've done in terms of taking this area further is we've created a network of inpatient units across the Yorkshire and Humber region and we meet remotely and we each take it in turns to present issues that are difficult and offer support. And that's been really, really important because I think units often feel very standalone and it's an area that's not spoken about. People feel very isolated. And so bringing people together has been really crucial and particularly during COVID. So I hope throughout my presentation, I've really highlighted just the absolute lack of research in this area. Um, and the need for more understanding of what it is like to work in these really difficult settings and what support staff need. And we've never needed that information more than we do now because this is a group that have had prolonged exposure to COVID-19. The flip side of that, of course, is that you've got a really specialist service here who have knowledge and experience that could be shared between other settings and other areas. And that's something to really think about. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation and I look forward to taking any questions. Okay, um, Emma, that was great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on the chat for questions. So what would be your, your, you know, your advice to um, people who said, well, what, you know, what were the key problems that came, came out of um, you know, the key issues that staff had? I mean, obviously a lot of the things about support, but there were, were there particular, things that they faced that they hadn't faced previously, which kind of came out of the blue? I think it's probably in relation to palliative care and needs and supporting people through end of life because we weren't able to move people into other settings. So it was really around skilling essentially mental health staff in palliative care skills very quickly and providing them support to, to manage death and dying in the vast numbers that we were. So did you, so did you have quite a few people with COVID on your ward then? Yeah, yes, yeah, because people were discharged from hospital and came in from care yes. homes, yeah, yeah. And, and it wasn't always possible to swab people because they were so unwell, and that was a picture across mental health wards. No, I, yeah, I'm just, 
I, I kind of I'm aware of that. I was just thinking about your you know your personal experience. And so yes. Yeah. Were, were there quite a few people that you had you know in this? Because presumably a ward is about twenty or twenty five people, but yeah. you had quite a few people in that position of palliative care then. Yes, we did. Yeah, which is very difficult to deliver in a mental health setting where you've got Absolutely, people that yeah. are acutely unwell as well. Yeah. Yes. It's hard to you know for people to. Um, be aware of the intensity of what people are going through at the time. Um, we've got a question here. What, it, what training is lacking for mental health support staff? So, you know, what, what could they do with in that uh, crisis situation, which, you know, we're worried that we're heading back into at the moment in terms of care homes and mental health wards? Lots of people had never experienced dying or death. They didn't know about the, the right. stages of someone dying. They didn't know how to make people comfortable at the end of life. So very, very generic palliative care skills, but how to, you know, that people were worried that people were dying of thirst, for example. So explaining how we could, you know, provide yes, massive yeah. care for someone and things. So really, you know, and then being able to explain that to families over a phone or, you know, in person. Is yes, really difficult yeah. As well, when you lack kind of confidence. Did you have any support from a local hospice? Because I would think that um, yeah. that that might be a, a resource that people could uh, could look to sometimes in terms of some of the uh, just you know some of the difficult things to to learn about. Yeah, we did, and that was invaluable. Really, the hospice team were incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just a comment from Katrina saying you've done fantastic work. Um, she's a psychiatrist working in inpatient settings. Um, and staff are feeling frustrated uh, with patients and families uh, with a lack of visiting and families are distressed and frustrated and you know what's your advice on how to manage the, the kind of problems with limits on I mean severe limits on visiting haven't they been really? We have and we've very much argued a palliative care approach so we open to visiting very very quickly and we're still open and we will stay right. open now in, in saying that you know we, the research tells us that most people admitted to mental health units with dementia die within six months after their admission right. so we've we've gone very much down a palliative care visiting approach and argued it along those lines mm. that okay. you know this is a, a progressive life limiting illness and, and people sure. visited. yeah I mean I know in um in some places, including the Netherlands, they've had large plexiglass plexiglass screens as as something to try to make life a bit easier. Did you have anything like that? Any adaptations? We've had like lots that? of or... options. We've had through the window visiting. We've had in through the, the garden. But now families wear enhanced PPE, and because people can't okay. always maintain the distancing, so families have infection control training on donning and doffing PPE, so that we know they're doing it safely. Yes. And yes, then they, that. you know, then we don't have to worry that there's no difference yeah. staff there, yeah. really. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think I'm just keeping an eye on the um, questions here. have got another point. Um, so what can you do to the environment to make it um, support orientation and familiarity? This is from Caroline Bartle. Thank you. In an inpatient setting in particular. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's obviously very very challenging we, we do all the usual dementia friendly stuff but really it's for us it's about the availability of staff so ensuring wow. that when people come out of a bedroom they're not in an unfamiliar environment there's always somebody there so we have staff in all the in all kind of main areas to help with orientation um, and people trying to make their room as homely as possible because obviously it's a okay. hospital setting um, so yeah the, the, I think for us, it's it's having staff around and, and, and helping people as much as it is about adapting the, the physical environment. But okay. outside space has been crucial. And so many inpatient mental health settings just don't have any access to outside space. That is, uh, it is the final frontier, isn't it, space? <laughs> Absolutely. No, yeah. I mean, because people people might be, you know, they, they can see outside, but they can't get outside because, uh, you know, doors are locked or they think the garden's unsafe or something like that. And it's... Uh, yeah. It's such an important thing. Yeah. Um, so, Emma, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. Yeah. I think maybe if we stop there, and um, thank you very much. Uh, very positive comment on your presentation. Oh, so you. I'd like to move on to Juan Luis Munez Sanchez, um, who's from Spain, and he's going to talk about changes and new psychosocial and psychogeriatric approaches um, for people with dementia in the outbreak in Spain. Uh, Juan Luis, I'll, over to you. Thank you. Hello. I'm Juan Luis Muñoz. Um, I'm from Spain, uh, from Rio Ortega uh, University Hospital. Um, 
en Castilla y León. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to stay here. Um, I'm going to, to show you uh, psychogeriatrics and dementia unit works and the changes uh, we have made uh, to adapt the COVID-19 pandemic. Here uh, you can see in, uh, <coughs> Castilla y León, uh, our region. Castilla y León is a region in, uh, in the northwest of Spain with nine provinces. Our psychogeriatric uh, and dementia unit uh, treat patients uh, from two provinces, Valladolid and, and Zamora. It's important to note that in this part of Spain, the population density is very low and the population is mainly rural. And also it should be noted that Castilla León is one of the regions with the greatest uh, population aging in, in Europe. The psychogeriatrics uh, and dementia unit belongs to the psychiatry department of the Strategic Alliance of Mental Health by Alifoest Zamora, which includes uh, three, three hospitals. The head of the department is Dr. Manuel Franco, The psychiatric uh, and dementia care network includes uh, a specific consultation uh, of psychogeriatrics and neuropsychologic uh, uh, unit, community care homes and nursing homes, a memory clinic, and a research uh, unit. For the past seven years, uh, a psychiatric care program has been implemented in a geriatric residential center, such as nursing homes and day centers. The objectives of this program are older, that older patients don't have to travel to the hospital, avoid unnecessary medical consultation, and avoid uh, going to the emergency department in acute situations. For several years, uh, We have developed um, a psychogeriatric network with uh, geriatrician from public and private uh, nursing homes. This net network has been uh, a key point for the support of people with dementia in nursing homes during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, geriatricians uh, always have the possibility to, uh, of referring patients uh, directly to the unit uh, without primary, uh, primary care. And we frequently, frequently uh, do training activities and regular meetings to present ongoing research uh, project and available uh, clinical trials in psychiatry, in psychiatry. In Spain, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, has generated uh, a great impact. We have, uh, we have a high rate of infection in Spain, we have uh, a very long uh, street confinement. This situation has greatly affected uh, the people with dementia. People with dementia are especially vulnerable uh, to COVID-19 infection. And nursing homes have been very affected uh, by the virus with a high mortality rate. At the moment, uh, in Spain, access uh, to medical centers is very restricted. Hospitals uh, are uh, environments uh, with a high risk of infection. For example, uh, people who live uh, in a nursing home and go out uh, for a medical consultation, when they return to uh, the nursing home, they have to pass a quarantine period that can be up uh, to two weeks even. So uh, we, we have done a, a transformation of psychogeriatric care and we have implemented uh, a new way of caring uh, and supporting based on e-health, driving to the reduction of risks of infection of people with dementia. We believe that uh, telepsychogeriatrics uh, should be prioritized and clinical assistance should be required by the user on demand. It's very important to treat patients quickly when they, when they need. 
but also it's very important to avoid treating patients when they are clinically stable and don't need it. Uh, appointments face-to-face -face, uh, were considered a risk of uh, people with dementia because they have exposed to be infected uh, by the health teams uh, as frontline workers in the studio uh, to the virus. For this reason, uh, we contact uh, all patients previously uh, by phone and depending on their clinical status and evolution, uh, different levels of care, of care uh, have been uh, considered. We had to change the way of working with house patients uh, and change the traditional face-to-face -face care with uh, telepsychiatric care. We are using different forms uh, of contact based of uh, new, te uh, new technologies for consultation and also for emergency care. Uh, we are using video conference, phone call, email, WhatsApp. All patients uh, with dementia who live at home and their relatives uh, have the psychotherapician mobile phone number to contact by phone call, text message, or WhatsApp. Here, uh, you can see an example of a message sent uh, by, by a relative of a patient with uh, dementia through WhatsApp. For video consultation uh, uh, with dementia patients living at home, we have tried to manage uh, all available platform to adapt to the possibilities and preference of patient or family members or caregivers. Of course, uh, video consultations are always made with the support of the family member or caregiver. We have also created different tools adapted to the pandemic uh, to many uh, people with dementia living at home. And all of these tools are integrated on a web page with open access. Here uh, you can see different tools uh, for caregivers of uh, people with dementia, uh, how to make a video consultation, uh, tips uh, for a quarantine, treatment of behavioral symptoms, protection of caregivers' mental health confinement, in confinement. In serious cases or patients with dementia with low social support, and the, the psychogeriatrician can go to the home patient uh, together with the nursing team or the social worker. At the hospital, we only treat seriously ill patients or those who require hospital admission. And we also treat at the hospital patients who are involved in a clinical trial, of course, uh, and those uh, whose study visit uh, require a, a physical present. About nursing home patients, the, the psychogeriatrics and dementia network with geriatrician, uh, the collaboration with geriatrician has been uh, really, really important at this time. And the geriatrician of the nursing home uh, and the psychogeriatrician organized in a coordinated way uh, the video consultations for, uh, for the following days. And the nursing home geriatrician always decide which patients uh, need uh, psychogeriatric care. We have considered telematic uh, care uh, as the main mo uh, care model during the COVID-19 pandemic for people with dementia living in nursing homes. It's important to know if the virus enters a nursing home, it has a catastrophic uh, effect during the video consultation, geriatrician and nurses can provide a lot of information about the clinical stat uh, status of dementia patient and the evolution. The nursing homes can also uh, guarantee uh, the correct working of the electronic devices uh, necessary for the video consultations. Geriatrician always have the possibility to contact directly by the, uh, <clears throat> with the psychogeriatrician uh, to address any clinical situation 
or question. They can contact through different channels, a phone call, or a video call, text message, WhatsApp, email, and for urgent uh, or serious uh, question or problems, then they can contact the psychogeriatrician outside of his working time. After several months of the pandemic, uh, we have considered uh, that it's a good time to analyze the change made and the clinical work of all of them in order to consider uh, the choice of going back to the traditional or, uh, care or maintain this new model of uh, way of work. Uh, we have made uh, a pool among the uh, workers of the nursing homes in order to know the, per the perception about the, the special psychiatric uh, care during the pandemic. Most of the workers have some high satisfaction with the telepsychiatric care reside and agreed to need, uh, <coughs> agreed on the need to maintain this form of care in the future. 94 of the professionals who might uh, consider video consultation as a good option for psychiatric care in nursing homes and the most useful models uh, for uh, telepsychiatric care in nursing home are telephone, video consultation, and, and WhatsApp. The world of the professional consider that the work of the psychiatrician in nursing homes avoid uh, admission to the hospital, and this is uh, really important. And 60% uh, of the professional don't consider physical present necessary if telecare uh, can be done. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Juan Luis. Um, that's an excellent presentation. And I think an inspiration to us for um, really showing what it is to, you know, to orientate your care and your service to the needs of the, of the other services in the nursing homes and the other doctors and obviously the patients and the family carers. But it's, um, it's, it's very impressive that all the different ways people have of contacting you, you know, WhatsApp, video consultation, the phone. It's really, I think, organizing the service around what people need. And I think we, we should all, uh, we can all admire that. Um, so I'll just have a look and see what questions are coming up. Um, so what, just out of interest, um, Juan Luis, what are the kind of questions that people would, would phone you about, that the geriatricians would call you about maybe out of hours? You know, what would they ring you for advice on? Um, yeah, the geriatrician of the, of the nursing home. Um, yeah. Generally, they, they call me for a, a small um, uh, consultations like uh, medications, uh, treatment, uh, or maybe for consider to uh, to program um, a video conference consultation. Also, uh, for example, uh, the geriatrician, uh, if consider that a new patient should be uh, um, treated by uh, by the psychogeriatrician the <coughs> generally they call me and, and explain me the the case and i, yeah. I, I okay i think is is very uh, is very necessary to to um, uh, treat this patient so we can organize uh, tomorrow the the video consultation yeah. or maybe yeah. I, today i'm i'm very i'm very busy uh, yeah. But you, you can put uh, uh, this medication to uh, to contain the acute yeah, sure, sure. and and in two days we can make the video consultation. Uh, I, I think that we, uh, so with the with the uh, video consultation you were making kind of remote diagnosis then really with the you know with the information that you have and seeing the patients and things like that. Yeah, uh, when when I uh, do a video consultation, I I have uh, I have all, uh, always the, um, all the um, clinical history of the of the patient. Uh, sure, yeah. In, yeah. in my uh, in my computer uh, with yeah. remote 
uh, affairs, yeah. And also it's very interesting that the the personal, the nursing, the nurse uh, of the nursing personnel of the of the of the nursing home uh, can provide uh, me yeah. the very very useful information. because sure. yeah. we yes we we recently um, I'm I'm looking at the comments everybody if you want to put comments in the chat but we we recently there was a paper come out in the in aging and mental health about remote memory assessment which. Uh, a lot of services in the UK are trying to do now. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the on the chat questions. Um, any any points or questions for Juan Luis? Juan Luis? Okay. Um, so, well, I think probably if we stop there, um, Juan Luis, thank you very much. Um, some virtual applause for me and everybody else, um, and also for Emma before you. So, uh, thank you. Very much. So, if we now move on to Andrea Fabo's presentation, please. Uh, Good uh, evening to all. Thanks to Alzheimer Europe Board with Eva Olmerova and Interdem Group with uh, this possibility. I am going to talk the management of people with dementia in a nursing home during COVID-19 crisis, our experience in the Modena model. The older population, the most frail and the vulnerable, has experienced the most dramatic consequences of the crisis, accentuated by AGEMS and the rules imposed during the lockdown. Um, the human rights concerns for older people stresses on the right to care, including intensive care, focus on mental health and dementia, the needs or the need of palliative care, access to information, digital risk of exclusions, prevention and protection, and high risk of abuse and social isolation, and the important role of the community. Um, the elderly problems during the crisis are social isolation, stigma, reduction of treatment for chronic disease, increased mental health problems such as depression, not always adequate management of problems related to dementia, increased burden and the stress of caregivers, poor use of palliative care, and the integrated networks model hospital community primary care responded better than hospital center models, regional differences in Italy. The problem of people with dementia regards daily problems, behavioral problems, and um, the management of dementia in care homes or nursing homes daily problems, quarantine and isolation have, have been difficult to implement effectively in nursing home, especially in setting as dementia care unit. In particular, the perception of the infection control practices seems in conflict with the quality of life goals and the rights of the residents because people living with dementia may might have difficulties in remembering safeguard procedures, such as wearing masks, washing hands, or avoids personal contacts, so it's more difficult to protect themselves. Behavioral problems regarding apathy, aggression, mood worsened by isolation, insomnia, anxiety and aggression due to imprisonment, uh, agitation and insomnia, he went out without respecting the restriction, delusions and opposition to care. Uh, while in uh, nursing home uh, or, or in care homes, we need to person-centered care model, dignity and protection, activities during the day, individual needs, a good communication, staff protection by personal protection equipment, staff training and supporting, and, uh, and uh, alliance with the family. 
in our network of services we have number five dementia special care unit in nursing home in this uh, special um, special care we have uh, some uh, people with dementia with the covid infection the crucial issues one it could be very useful to share the accessible spaces in COVID in and COVID free areas where people can move free, minimizing crisis and preserving freedom and independence. Activity of screening to identify all positive residents. Within the COVID area with people with dementia, the challenges is manage the infection risks and maintain the personal dignity. Should be avoid all visits in the area from relatives or friends and non-essential personnel. Staff should be provided to facial masks and all necessary equipment to assist properly and minimizing risks. It's important that the staff receive all information about the infection and the control practices and understand the importance of variation in daily practices. Crucial issues two, the staff should not forget the main principles of best care practice for people with dementia and find a compromise between the safety procedures the patient's needs and the new solution of care. The level of anxiety among staff in nursing home is high. The education, some breaks and psychological support could be important tools to prevent the burnout. Psychologists can provide online consultation for the staff and for patients' relatives. Crucial issues three. It's not necessary to avoid completely the use of occupational activities, but it's possible to choose those, those activities without direct physical interaction, such as uh, listen to music, watch movies, or read the newspapers or novels. It's also important to maintain physical distance as much as possible. A strategy, for example, to avoid manipulation of materials from a residence to another could be the creation of personal boxes for every residence. These boxes could be filled with favorite materials that will be used only to one person, such as clothes, coloring pages and pencils, newspapers and so on. Create, create a separated facility for the COVID positive patients, permit the possibility to move free in the COVID area, to have different night and day spaces, and go home with meaningful activities. This organization helps people living with dementia not to develop delirium, sleep disorders, challenging behaviors, and hypomobility syndrome. The crucial issues for is communication. A good communication should be maintained with all residents. If a patient has got eating environment, worsened from the use of masks, could be introduced the use of black poppers or paper to write on. It's important to permit to stay in touch with loved ones with the telephone calls or video visits. If the COVID area is at the ground floor, could be possible organize visit from the window, scheduling a time for a call, a video chat, or window windows visit may may make it easy it easier. Frequent contacts with the staff can also be useful as well phone call with the psychologist. What we learned. We need of a new organization, one, the spaces, safety environments to ensure wandering, suitable spaces for the activities they must do safely, common spaces must increasingly become living spaces and not transient areas, guarantee the prosthesis also with technology and using innovative solutions, rethinking the model. A new organization, people, smaller units, wards with uh, adequate number of staff, flexible organization in response to needs, 
adequate staff training, support with the appropriate personal protective equipment, revise the excessively standardized procedures on the assembly line, rising the level of health care to ensure the most appropriate care. The activities, more individualized activities and calibrated on the effective needs of the person with dementia and his history. Delegated to all the staff also during the assistance uh, maneuvers during the care, use of technology. They must be an integral part of the individual care plan and they should be ecological, the things of home. Another point is technology, computerized folder via web that communicates with the hospital and health services network. Nursing home is not an island. Monitoring the systems, telemedicine, cognitive stimulation and occupational therapy with ICT and home automation. And another point, another point regarding the need for a new organization is, um, is family caregivers. Regulate access but ensure maximum openness without restriction to virtual visits, video calls, telephone calls, transparency and external communication of what is done with the older people, sharing strategy choices with the family members, Reflect on the fact that some behavioral problems in dementia decreased during closures. Free access equal to greater humanization of care, of care, we don't know. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so some very um, helpful advice there on how to um, better prepare units for uh, dealing with COVID and protect the rights of uh, people with dementia. Would anybody like to make any comments in the chat that we could um, think about? Uh, it's obviously difficult. We don't have Andrea here, but it's a very, very helpful presentation fitting with the, the general theme. And um, our very informative presentation, Stefan has said, which is good. Um, and of course, it will be. We do have the chat. Um, very interesting, a lot of similarities with um, the Flemish Centre of Expertise on Dementia. It's challenging, COVID is challenging, but can accelerate in innovation and rethinking care. So that's, I think, a very good point is that it has, ha it has forced us to actually try and think about how to change things quickly. And it's forced us to, to innovate. Okay, so it's now, we're just after two. So, if we uh, give uh, Andrea, in his absence, some, some virtual applause. Thank you very much, Andrea. And then we'll um, go on to our final speaker, the um, uh, Eva Homerova, who's a member of the Interdem board and also suddenly uh, re-elected chair of Alzheimer Europe. So very pleased to, uh, very pleased to welcome you, Eva. Thank you, Martin, for your introduction. Um, hello, everybody. As you see, I am Eva Holmerova. I am from the Czech Republic. Uh, my background is consultant uh, geriatrician. I am CEO of the Center of Gerontology in Prague, age district, founder of Czech Alzheimer's Society, and for many, many years, a board member of Alzheimer uh, Europe, now recently re-elected for next two years. So it is my honor to be for next two years again with, with Alzheimer Europe and also with Interdem. And my experience is not only professional, but also uh, family, a personal one, because my uh, mother uh, died with uh, the vascular dementia and her partner uh, with, uh, with Alzheimer's, lived and died with Alzheimer's disease. So also this experience. And I would like to uh, uh, take you through our experience to present to um, uh, broader or just uh, draft case studies of how we tackled the first uh, wave of uh, uh, COVID-19 epidemic in our country in different uh, long-term care institutions. And yes, when I prepared this uh, abstract of my presentation, 
I just uh, based it on our experience from the first wave. But in the in the meantime, we have the second wave, which is much more severe as it appears in our country. And uh, problems that already were well known are uh, became even more uh, clear. And I I can say that in the during the first wave, we focused more on the uh, infection itself. Uh, we were trying to protect uh, our patients, clients, ourselves from the infection. And uh, during this experience, we learned that uh, coronavirus, it is not a phantom, it is a biological material and it is possible to, uh, to protect. And therefore we find that in the second wave, uh, the more severe problem is the psychosocial uh, one uh, psychological impact of uh, isolation, social distancing, uh, fear, uh, anxiety, etc. So it is, but let us go back to my presentation to start with that, because it is already a bit historical one, which I did not did not suppose when I, when I presented, but I, I hope that you find it is interesting as well, because much of what I wanted to add uh, already was presented in, in fantastic presentation of uh, speakers in the beginning of this uh, uh, session. Here is my potential conflict of interest as chair of Alzheimer, Alzheimer Europe. And uh, just, just to start this, the first wave of coronavirus uh, between March and June. And uh, in the uh, Czech uh, health and social care system, we have uh, uh, about 1,000 different nursing and residential homes. Uh, they are split between two sectors, between uh, health and social care, and it would take me the rest of my presentation time to explain you whole whole system of our residential special homes, nursing homes, nursing hospitals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I will skip it because because it is difficult to understand even even for people uh, people here. But in principle, it is split between health and social care, and it is it is important. There were obligatory restrictive measures uh, from March to June 2020 including a ban for visiting uh, residential homes, uh, uh, including uh, people were not allowed to leave uh, uh, residential homes, etc., etc. So they really suffered from, from isolation uh, and, and it, was, it was difficult and, and all, all um, nursing homes and residential homes and hospitals were trying to connect them somehow. And we were lucky to have modern technologies to, to uh, enable contacts with their friends and families and so on. Uh, the uh, rates of infections were not so high in our country and therefore uh, all, only because now it is already 150 or more nursing homes with uh, coronavirus infection. But at that time in this first wave, it was 40 nursing homes that were put into obligatory quarantine and had to follow measures, uh, strict measures by hygienic uh, authorities. So I will not discuss them. But I would like to discuss uh, 40 nursing homes with their preventive quarantine of residents and staff that were usually uh, between four, uh, between two and, and four weeks. So I will discuss two models of residential care protection and infection prevent prevention, this voluntary quarantine and this uh, long-term care pre uh, protection through healthcare and, and organization uh, measures. The first case I can present on the case of uh, Krapčice, uh, residential and special care home that uh, went into the voluntary quarantine from the beginning uh, to the end of April. And it was the decision of uh, the staff during the, uh, their meetings, they decided to uh, isolate themselves uh, to protect them from infection, from coronavirus infection, both staff and residents. Krapčice uh, Podřípem, it is very picturesque and nice place and the, the, the nursing home is really very nice and very, the leadership is very modern there. They have one uh, together in different buildings, 
uh, above 100 places of residential and special dementia care. And uh, 50 staff members decided voluntarily to participate in this voluntary isolation, in this voluntary quarantine. They had to undergo uh, PCR tests and all that were negative. It was most of them, 40, 48, uh, just closed themselves with their residence in, in uh, the nursing home. It is the group of, uh, of staff that, that decided to go for it, for this adventure and new, very, very new experience in their lives, I believe. And uh, it was not easy to accommodate them because uh, the, the nursing homes are, as we know them, not, not very spacey. And therefore, they were helped by, uh, by uh, entrepreneurs from their environment. And they, they lived in such a, uh, boxes or, or how, how we can call it, small houses. It was uh, nice summer weather so, uh, or, or spring weather. So it was not, not that problem. So they accommodated uh, themselves in the, in the area of the nursing home. And the, the nursing home, not only buildings, but, but uh, the garden were closed and nobody was allowed to go in and out. The roles changed, and and the leader of this this voluntary quarantine was a was a director. And now, because the, not all staff at kitchen was present, so so he um, started to to act not only as a director but also as a kitchen a helper. Here we, we can see it's it himself right up in the in the picture, and here we can uh, see normal just normal life uh, in not normal conditions of this uh, of this nursing home uh, uh, people and uh, people uh, residents and people uh, staff were more together doing different different activities here we, we can follow them again and they kindly provided us this this all pictures and which were presented also during Prague days of their gerontology it is necessary to say that uh, during this voluntary quarantine, staff and residents were supported by families, local people, companies, and so on. And they were followed also by uh, different media uh, and, uh, that presented them as our heroes, which was quite exceptional. I think that they really contributed to with this effort to improve the uh, PR picture of, of nursing home staff that war was uh, un until this time very under um, funded and uh, underestimated. And another pictures we can see here also, they tried to enable better communication with families, etc. So what is preventive lockdown of a nursing home? It is staff and residents staying uh, together for two to four weeks. And uh, yes, and no spread of infection is the, uh, this, this time and during the summer was the result, but it was not exceptional because I said already the uh, infection numbers were very, very low that time. It had uh, positive effects on residents. They felt more care, more peer relationships. Uh, but there, was there were positive reactions of general public, support, present, woodings, as you can see, music in the, uh, outside the garden. They were called our heroes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, possibly also good for team building. I am not sure about it that much, but yes, possibly some, some do refer it. But of course, it had many side effects. Uh, despite the increased support of staff and rewarding public reactions, staff felt, felt isolated from families. They, there was a stronger feeling of conflict between the professional and family roles. Of course, burnout occurred uh, in, many, in many cases. And uh, many of uh, staff members said that they would not be willing to repeat this experience again. So it was a nice adventure, but not very, very sus sustainable. Here is another model this, that was implemented in uh, nursing institutions of health uh, care type. And it was an attempt of integrating health care into the residential care practice. And there are several examples of nursing homes, care unit, uh, long-term care hospitals, etc. And also some residential homes consulted healthcare staff and professionals uh, 
that helped them to implement preventive measures and plans that were consulted and modified together, that was re-evaluated re and, and again implemented, all possible paths of infections was detected, et cetera, et cetera. It was such a long and boring procedure, but it was effective. But the focus especially was on efficiency, effectiveness, and sust especially, especially sustainability. So it was something, uh, this, this a splendid isolation. It was something about the heart, about the care, about the anxiety that something could could happen. But this was mo mostly based on what we knew about the the infection, and on the uh, on the uh, evidence and and ratio. It was not that spectacular, but uh, but I think that it could be the way forward. So I think that the absolute isolation is not a solution, that it is necessary to go on more professionally and include also, uh, and especially healthcare measures into, and hygienic measures into the organization of care. And therefore the education of staff at all levels, not only in psychosocial issues, but also in healthcare issues uh, is very, very necessary because all staff members need to learn and internalize how to prevent from, from the infection and how to all go on. And it was discussed already also at our uh, meeting at the European Union Geriatric Medicine Society. And here you can find these two publications about uh, um, uh, standards for physicians in nursing homes and about uh, the guidance for uh, for care in nursing homes because we know that in some European countries deaths in care homes represent uh, about 50 percent or even more of all COVID related deaths. So here, here are discussion points for next actions and I don't think it is uh, not necessary to read them all. Uh, yes, we need education and training in, in all spectrum and activities uh, access to appropriate care skills, et cetera, da feedback from data control, linkage with other agencies on the local and international and, and the national levels, et cetera, because there are also important ethical issues and, and we need to uh, properly plan our care, uh, care for, for these very vulnerable people. And I was speaking about health and social care split and health, health and co-social care uh, professionals education. And it is, not, it is necessary also to put together uh, health and social care or psychosocial research and health care research or bio biomedical research. And I do not speak about it because it was shown already very nicely in this presentation, uh, in this publication that you can find in aging and mental health. And my conclusions are that, uh, yes, that infectious diseases have been with us during all existence of humanity and new challenges are have been always emerging and it will continue to happen, of course. So we need professional care and education. And I would like to remind you of one health strategy because only healthy, healthy people can live only with, uh, with healthy animals on our healthy planet. So I think it is a very important strategy that I would like to highlight in the in the end of my presentation. Okay, um, thank you very much, Eva. Um, an excellent presentation. I think, you know, taken together what we've heard this afternoon, it really shows innovation. I mean, I'm I'm full of admiration for the staff in the nursing home who went into lockdown, but it it must be. It must have been uh, very difficult and um, you know, more challenging as the time went on. And um, uh, Marjolaine de Voot said, um, you know, now as we're going into the second wave, are you experiencing you know, kind of exhaustion and burnout in staff? And it, you know, how do you deal with that really? Yes, yes, I, we do. And it, it was our warning, uh, we were trying to discourage uh, nursing mm -hmm. homes from these this very extensive measures. And uh, I think that the way forward is to, to learn uh, not only psychosocial interventions, but also uh, how to protect uh, just uh, healthcare skills, put it together and to, to um, educate staff as much as we can. Because as I said in the beginning, it is not a phantom, it is a biological material and we can protect ourselves and somehow we can protect also we have to protect also our clients it's been i mean it's um it's we, we're now you know in the process of 
knowing what the second wave looks like um, for very many countries across Europe. So we've got some, um, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, can we um, give uh, Eva a virtual round of applause for a uh, great uh, presentation, but, but um, and also, do we have any more points on the chat? I'm keeping an eye on it. And I think there's, if you look at what we've discussed this afternoon, um, it's, it's a, a lot of contributions to, to innovative care. Um, so we've got a point here from the, um, the Flemish government uh, uh, called on temporarily unemployed people to work in nursing homes, uh, distributing meals, um, and they're going to respond with uh, e-learning about uh, basic knowledge and communication tips. So, um, so this is asking about different countries and the support they've had from the public. I mean, uh, it's, uh, you know, it, so, and um, Anthony Scarry said, uh, has asked about, um, so let's do the questions first from uh, Lynche de Vector in um, Belgium about have other people found that, that there's been quite, uh, quite a lot of support from the public in terms of helping nursing homes and maybe making contributions, maybe uh, working there. I'm keeping an eye on the chat here. Any other thoughts on that? Okay. Um, well, there's a question for Eva. Um, when the private nursing homes went into voluntary lockdown, um, was there any support from the from the um, from the local the local government? You know, would they? Yeah. Yes. Yes, there was there was support. Uh, it, it, I cannot speak generally because it was uh, 40 cases and we do not have information about all. But generally, when they went into voluntary quarantine, they were supported by uh, by local authorities, by entrepreneurs, by public. You see, so the support was important. Um, as I said already, answering uh, Marjorie's questions, we were um, more discouraged from this way of doing things because we, we felt that people would be uh, very, uh, very easily um, ex uh, just exhausted and, and burned out and so on. Yes, yeah. There is one, one very positive thing that I, I think it had that our general public just uh, felt that these professionals are important. You see, yes, yeah. it was not so many cases. I think it would be disaster when this would happen in the second wave with so many nursing homes. But in this first wave, I think that for the public relation, for the better understanding yeah, yeah. how how nicely these people that are so poorly paid and really yeah. generally underestimated, yeah. that they provide such a fantastic care, uh, how nice people they are, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. There were all really many many uh, presentations and many many shots in on the TV, etc. So I think that for yeah, the population yeah. and for the understanding of this care, it was important. But my personal wish would be not to repeat this experience. Yes, but it. it um, yes, I can I can see why. But also, um, having you know, a nursing home that does something so dramatic and so kind for people. And having people sleeping there, and the pictures of the the camper vans and the small little rooms to sleep in, uh, I mean, something like that does really uh, make people realise, uh, you know, what people are going through and how passionate people are about care. So yeah. even even if you've got one nursing home doing it, it does make it it uh, acts like a beacon for others to see. Um, you know what's going on and to be, become aware of it um, yeah yeah, in, yeah. Um, in the uk we had um, a man who was 100 called major tom who was walking around his garden till yeah. he went around 100 times and it it got a lot of publicity but it was for the nhs so it was all very it was all very he raised a lot of money in the end but again it's the these particular things that that uh, make people uh, care and be passionate and be grateful. Yes, um, I'm just seeing if we've got any other we possibly in the chat. Um, okay, um, Emma's saying what happened in the UK. Well, we in the UK we had clap for carers. We had clap for the NHS initially at eight o'clock on a on a Thursday night, and then it was clap for carers to take into account uh, all the people who are working in in nursing homes. Um, 
and all the great job and the risks people are taking as well because people were taking people working in the nhs or working in care homes for covid were taking risks um of catching the infection so it's uh, you know very makes you realize how important it is to you know to support everybody really and care for care for each other yeah to be honest, when I may may add something, because I feel that we have few you do, minutes. Yeah. To, uh, You're a speaker, so, you can add anything. Yeah, yeah so we are panelists that, yeah. <laughs> so if I may add, yeah, my, my um, position was quite opposite. I admire this, this uh, effort, but uh, towards my staff, I was already advising, stay calm, relax, uh, yes. take care of yourself, protect yourself, because worst uh, times are coming you see so it is yes. it is a bit different attitude and we have to be professional and we have to be professional not only from the psychosocial point but also from the nursing and medical and hygienic point and it is a i think incredible example that is shown that we really have to collaborate also in nursing homes yes i think i agree with you and i think we may have thought it was going to be a sprint but it's turning into a marathon very quick marathon well, yes, uh, it's, well, it's going to be, yes, we're not through it yet, though. Um, so any um, final points? It's, uh, we've just got a few minutes to go. I'm very grateful to everybody who's um, uh, been involved this afternoon, all those who've made comments. Um, I'll just do a final check on things. So I think it's always good to finish a few minutes early. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers. Um, Emma Wolverson, Joan Luis Munez Sanchez, Andrea Fabo, and of course our last speaker, Eva Homerova. So thank you, everybody. It's been a really, really great um, seminar and very, very uh, helpful and I think inspirational for many of us. And we've got some comments on the chat there. Thanks for a great session. So I'm going to say I'm going to say goodbye now and um, look forward to um, more to come. Thank you. Bye bye.